appreciate it. Hey, y'all. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out at the end of the day, you know, end of the conference. Um, this is who I am. Some of you know me. Uh, I met a bunch of you already, so thanks for coming up if you did. Uh, specifically, this week in bevy.com, if you're here for bevy, weekly bevy. And so, you know. Uh, this talk is going to be about the ergonomics that Bevy offers uh, from a Rust API perspective. So um, how many people have used Bevy at all? Okay. How many people have shipped a game? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, this isn't quite an intro to Bevy talk. It's a, like uh, Bevy from like a Rust API's perspective. So um, for anybody on the internet that hasn't used Bevy, uh, we might get a little bit more into the API details than uh, you know, an intro course. Um, but this is roughly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, there's a whole lot to talk about. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Bevy or wondering what people are actually doing with Bevy, um, Tiny Glade is one uh, game built with Bevy, heavy on procedural generation. They've been around since, I think, uh, 0.6. We're on 0 0.13 now. Um, they do their own custom renderer. They use Bevy ECS and stuff. It's wonderful. Um, there's some like non-game usage of Bevy out there. Uh, Foresight Spatial Labs does a whole bunch of like physics simulation, rendering, things like that. Um, scientific research visualization in Bevy, uh, which is very cool. And then you know more games. Uh, this is a fantasy colony uh, sim builder. Uh, Bevy is a very 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 large project. Uh, I do a lot of educational uh, work with Rust kind of talk about um, people writing their you know, first 10, first 100, first 1,000 lines, and how to like, pick a project somewhere in there. Uh, Bevy is 130,000 plus lines of Rust. So uh, it's a lot. It's a big project. There's a lot of APIs. There's a lot of tests. Um, which brings me to like, the main takeaway from the talk is Bevy deals with a whole stack of APIs. They all compose together in different ways. Um, and to me, Bevy is basically the progressive disclosure of the complexity of building these kinds of applications and games. So we're going to start at the beginning. Um, it's the end of day two, so y'all have all seen this already. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about preludes to start. So this is basically uh, Bevy Hello World, but you know it doesn't really run anything, right? Um, so we've got use, bevy, prelude, star at the top. Uh, it basically does nothing. It runs and it stops. You know, we've got app, new, run, whatever. Uh, but preludes, right? Uh, a lot of crates use them. Some crates don't. They're mostly good if you're doing like API design. If people are going to use your crate, they're going to use some set of it. If it's not the total set, it's going to be like an 80% set or whatever. Uh, preludes are great for that. There's very little downside. Um, the only downsides are kind of like, which crate does this item come from? If you're uh, a new person and you don't have Rust Analyzer set up yet, you have no additional tooling, you're looking at a file, there's like five preludes that all got imported. Uh, but I mean, that's you know, a little bit more of an edge case. You know? it's a, preludes are generally uh, very good things. They're used by a whole bunch of projects. Um, here's a couple, Bevy, Wasm, Bindgen, Rand. If you've never looked at standard, standard is a prelude. That's why you can access things in your Rust files <laughs> without importing them. Um, sometimes they're not needed. Iter tools, all the functions that you're going to use on iter tools, it's an extension trait. It extends iterator. Therefore, all of the functions are on that trait. You only need to import one thing. You don't really need a prelude. Um, also, if you export everything from your crate, you probably don't need a prelude because it's everything, right? It's going to be everything from lib. Uh, so constructing app is kind of our next thing to talk about. And how do you build those functions? Um, in this example, we see app. And app comes in from the prelude we just talked about. Uh, so we've got new, and we've got something that kind of looks like a builder pattern, kind of looks like the beginning of a builder pattern, not quite a builder pattern yet. So let's talk about app and why we're using this new function, right? So app is difficult to construct manually, is the way that I'll phrase it. Um, it's almost impossible to construct manually because there's private fields. 
Um, but even if you look at World, you look at Box, Dine, FN Once, you look at this interned Dine schedule label thing, like if you're a new person, you're starting a new Bevy app, or you're just like writing a new Bevy project, um, not something that you really want to like manually construct out and build up, right? So pretty obvious pretty quickly that we want a better way to do that. So new is the way that we do that with Bevy. Um, and whenever you know constructing that app is hard, constructing that struct is hard, constructing that thing is hard, or you have kind of like limited, uh, limited ways to do that, um, app new is great. Now app new with no arguments is basically a default implementation. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Rust, there's a default trait, you implement the default trait, you do app colon colon default, you get what is basically new. But there can be other ways, right? Here's empty. Empty is the same as new, it just does less for you. So while new is what you're going to use, empty is something you might use in a test, or if you have very specific use cases, something like that. Um, we talked about how new is basically default. In this case, new is literally default. This is code snapshotted from Bevy's code. This is, this is, this is new inside of Bevy's code base. Um, so that means empty is the odd one out, right? Kind of. Uh, the default implementation calls empty. So there's this like beginnings of a stack of APIs where um, most people are gonna use new, right? Most people aren't even gonna think about this. They're never gonna see empty. They're not gonna care. Um, but we have new, we have the default implementation, we have empty, we have config feature flags inside of here for turning things on and off based on what you're actually using. Uh, we're gonna talk about feature flags later. But this is Bevy basically being built with Bevy's exposed APIs. Uh, empty, of course, calls even more default implementations. So we've got a new world. We've got the absolute minimum for that world. We've got a bunch of defaults for all those private fields and things like that. The one thing I want to point out here is that the default runner is run once, right? You think of a Bevy, yeah, you think of a Bevy game as something that like spawns a window and you start playing, and it runs and updates and updates, and you get a bunch of frames, maybe hundreds, if you're you know, running a 4090 or something. Uh, but the default is to run once. Uh, you have to have like the Winnet plugin or something to run many times or do it manually. Um, new and things like new, like empty, uh, are very common across a whole number of crates. This is Glam. Glam powers bevies like Vec2, Vec3, any, any of the math, really. Uh, so you can see how new can take arguments. It doesn't need to be a default default. Uh, if you have specific ways to construct your values, uh, like splat here, for example, right? Same value, all three slots, same exact thing. Making construction easier, only requiring users to supply what they need to care about. Uh, so takeaways, new functions, or methods, technically. Uh, we're gonna be casual here, they're all functions. Uh, <laughs> for difficult constructions, things that have private fields, things that you can't construct, things that are hard to construct, things you don't wanna construct. Um, when there are many ways to construct, you can have a bunch of these different functions. You can have new, empty, splat, you know, space shuttle, whatever, I don't know. Uh, sometimes they're more social than technical, right? Sometimes this is a social decision to provide a new function. Yes, default exists, but everybody, when they're writing their first Bevy app, uses new. Why? Well, people are used to new. Every other language uses new for constructing new classes, new everything. So if there's a new function, people from other languages are very familiar with that. Uh, you can see here Vec2 new in Glam and Vec2 the struct construction are like a parenthesis away from each other. So sometimes more social than actually needed. Um, zero argument new is default default. That is. If you have a zero argument new, that is basically what that's going to be. Um, and you can prevent struct construction if you want to, even if you don't have like private fields or anything like that. So non-exhaustive uh, macro, that kind of thing, if you want to do that. So we've got an app. It's got a bunch of private fields. How do we, how do we app? How do we get an app? How do we get a thing that works? Um, back to our original example. I've added a system now 
So we've got app. We're doing some configuration. We're adding a system. Uh, we're going to talk about that little update in a second here. Don't worry about it too much. But remember, when I said before, the runner runs once. So it'll run this app. Update will run once. That's why we get one update print log out instead of like 500 or something like that. And just to point it out, uh, default does work, right? We talked about default, new and default. New is implemented as default. You can just call default. It's just that socially, we don't do this, which is fine. So builder pattern, right? If you're using Rust, you've probably seen builders. Um, Bevy's app is kind of always valid, right? So we don't need a special app builder because new and empty are just going to return you something that you can just call run on. When it comes to builders, we've got kind of like initialization, configuration, and then finalization or execution. Sometimes those are the same. Sometimes they're different. This is a larger example of an app. We haven't covered a lot of these concepts yet. We'll cover resources. We'll cover uh, things like that later. But basically, app new, do a bunch of configuration, finish it, run it, your app runs. So initialization, again, we don't have an app builder. App is basically always valid for Bevy. So new and empty, they return app. They don't have to return anything else. We get a whole bunch of configuration functions on app to add things like systems, to add things like events, to add state or resources or anything like that. Uh, the key takeaway here is that these functions take and return exclusive references. So. When we call one of these functions, we're mutating that original app. We don't get a new one. When we return here, we're returning an exclusive reference to app that we can then drop later. So that lets us set it up in any way we really want to. But we're always mutating the original. And then we've got the finalizer, right? So in this case, we're running run. Um, this calls the runner inside of the app. The one thing that I'll mention here is that if you tie win it, to Bevy using the Win plugin that is built into Bevy, uh, then you get a runner that runs a whole bunch of times, right? It ties it to the window updates. So let's talk about app, because app seems to be very important, right? Um, and it is. It's how everything comes together. The Bevy app crate is the sort of high-level, single pane of glass interface through which you access everything else. And as we'll cover in a second, um, it's also not the most important thing, right? Because everything inside of Bevy is kind of separated out and modularized and stacked at a whole bunch of different API levels. So you don't need app to do everything, right? It is the point of, like, single pane of glass, but, like, there are a whole bunch of crates that you can turn on and off depending on what you need. You can use individually depending on what they do. Um, some of them you won't want to use individually. Some of them, like Bevy ECS, you can use without the rest of it. Um, you'll want to turn like Bevy UI on and off. Time is a thing here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Which brings us to features, right? Um, short side note, every one of these images is a Bevy app or game on every one of these heading slides. So. Bevy by default comes with a whole bunch of features enabled. Uh, these, some of these are crates. You can read them right off, Bevy Winit, Core Pipeline, PBR. Uh, that's a bunch of rendering stuff. Uh, even the asset system, audio, is a really common one to turn off. Uh, there's a third-party crate called Bevy Kira Audio. So you would have to turn off this Bevy Audio feature uh, to like, properly use Bevy Kira Audio. And this is sitting inside of Bevy, inside of the Prelude. Like, you don't even get access to these if you start turning these features off. Right? They're just gone. Um, this is one of the really powerful things about Bevy, right? Uh, you get to, if you need to, just take a chunk of it, get rid of it, and replace it with something else. So I want to talk about systems, but to talk about systems, we have to like, talk about ECS and what it is um, and like, why these three letters matter. <laughs> uh, this is the statement in the docs. I've, uh, chopped it up a little bit to fit on a slide. Um, but if you can find me a design pattern 
that doesn't have the description of encourages decoupled, uh, you know, whatever that breaks up your app and data logic. Um, I'll give you a cookie. I don't know. I, <laughs> they all say this, right? So like, and then there's something about you know parallelism and performance and whatever. This is kind of how I would describe it. Uh, Bevy's ECS specifically, um, but ECS in general, enables working with only kind of what you need when you need it. So if your players have lives, right, and you need to remove a life, then your system only needs access to the lives count for those players to decrement them, right? Uh, if you need to move you know, a laser from a ship across the screen or the player across the screen, you don't need access to you know, the player and the dog subclass and the, the whatever, 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 right? You don't need this huge inheritance chain. You just need the transform of the player and the input controls. So ECS, long form, entity component system. If you've used Bevy, you've probably seen this. If you haven't used Bevy, this is probably meaningless to you. Um, entity is literally a U32. Like, there's, there's nothing more really to that. Um, well, there's a little bit more to that. Uh, it's a little bit of a lie. <laughs> but an entity is an ID, basically, right? Uh, components, data, structs, enums, just things that are, uh, you know, stateful. Systems are regular functions, and that's super important, actually. Uh, so let's go for entities first. So everything gets an ID. Everything is an entity, or, you know, most things are entities. Um, the IDs are generational, so you actually get a, a tuple of two U32s. You don't just get one. Um, and it's almost like a VEC, right? So imagine that you stored everything in your game in a VEC, that each of them existed at some index, and then like the thing at index three died and you removed it. Then you spawned something else. It went into the index three slot, because index three is empty. How do you tell they're different? Right? That's what a generational index is. So index number three, version one, or index three, version two. That's it. Th those are the two numbers, literally. Components, state and data, things like how much health your player has, uh, whether they are the player or not, right? They don't have to carry actual data. They can just be tags. Um, how fast they can go, the speed, uh, the type of the enemy can be an enum. You only get one instance of each component type for each uh, entity, right? So it can't be a ghost crab or a skeleton crab ghost. You get one of them. Systems, regular Rust functions, they operate on components. The dependencies are supplied by Bevy, which is one of those really, really important ergonomic choices. So here we've got this function. Um, we query for all the transforms in our world, basically. And then we multiply the Y by two every update for all the transform components. This is the uh, sort of app that I pulled those two examples from. So we've got app new. We've got a couple of systems added at different times. Um, we haven't talked about startup update, post update yet. We will. And then we run it. So on startup, we spawn in an entity that has a transform component. We spawn in that uh, entity at 111, arbitrary location. Every update, we multiply that Y value by two. And after every update on post update, we're just printing everything out. So you can see here, um, if it's not too far bottom left, the people in the back, basically entity zero, version one. That's the entity ID. That's what we just talked about. And then we've got the component for that entity that has a translation of x1, y2, z1, which is exactly what we just had. So we're spawning an entity. We have a system that queries for all transforms or all entities with a transform, gets us those transform components, we mutate it, we move on. So the fact that we can use regular functions as systems is a really important ergonomic choice for Bevy. Because we write a lot of them. Like, we, we write a lot of systems. That's how all of the logic is written. So you're going to be writing a lot of functions. If they weren't regular functions, if they were some like weird construction thing that you had to do inside of main or whatever, it would be really annoying. Um, here we've got laser movement. It's another system. 
queries for all entities that have both a transform and a laser component that identifies them as a laser. Uh, and then we get time as well, because deciding how far a laser moved uh, either gets tied to the frame rate or tied to the amount of time that has passed. You want the time that has passed, not the frame rate. Otherwise, that uh, you know, kid with the 4090 is going to be moving a lot faster. And thus, lasers move. That system is all we need to move lasers across the screen. So this ship fires a laser, it just keeps going, and it keeps moving, and then <coughs> it goes off the screen and disappears, and we don't respawn it. Uh, so that could be super, super generic. It could have been linear move, right? Instead, it was laser. This is generally dependency injection. Dependency injection is a little bit complicated, so we're not really going to get too deep into it. But here's a couple links. Um, this uh, sort of book, Dependency Injection Like Bevy from Scratch, is really great. If you are going to go implement this kind of system, definitely go read it. Axum does a similar thing with From Request. Um, and we're going to talk about system params. Uh, but dependency injection at a high level is just passing arguments to functions. This is the system param trait. Uh, don't get too hung up on all you know, lifetimes and trait bounds and whatever. Uh, there's some state. There's an item. We can initialize that state. We can get the item. That's, that's really what I want to get across on this slide. As a user of Bevy, you never really see this trait. Like, you'll never like, ask for a system param uh, explicitly, unless you're writing a library that does something special. This is a list of system params that are common in Bevy. Uh, we saw query already. We can query for components. Uh, we actually saw res, which is resource, which is for global data that we'll cover in a second, and then res mute, which is for mutable resource. Local state is local. Uh, commands are how we mutate the world. We saw a capital W world when we looked at app. That is kind of like everything. It all sits there. And then we've got event readers and event writers. How a function can turn into a system uh, is a giant stack of traits, um, traits that can be implemented in various ways, uh, a bunch of intos uh, kind of traits as well, um, the system params, a couple of macros. Uh, it's pretty deep, honestly. Um, so if you're going to implement a system like this, um, this is an industrial strength version of it. But I'm going to tell you to read the code, because it doesn't fit on a slide or two or five, actually. Could be a whole, uh, a whole talk in its own. So what we're going to do instead is talk about all these system params and a little bit about how they work and what value they provide. So let's start with global state. Resources. Uh, typically, in a Rust app, for global state, you do something like const, maybe static. Uh, because we have this app, because we have this world that contains everything, we can just create this resource. We can get this resource anytime. And we're only allowed to have one. So that's enforced. This is both a great example of what I was talking about earlier in that everything can decompose. So like, you don't need app to be able to insert a resource into the world. right? App has insert resource in that builder. But we don't need it if we just have a world already. So we've got this resource struct. We have to derive resource on it. It's just a U32, and we've got two systems here, one that reads, one that writes. Then we've got local state. So we've got global state and resources, and we've got local state with local. This is the same example we saw earlier, uh, only slightly modified to not have dot run anymore, because dot run is only running for one update, and I wanted to look at two. So this is app. We add our systems just like before. Remember, we're getting mutual or exclusive references to this app, so we can do this kind of however we want. Those references can drop anytime we want. We just need the original one. Uh, and then we call update twice instead of calling update once. So at the bottom, what's changed in this example is that instead of just having one output, post update has run twice and update has run twice. But startup has only run once. So we get. Uh, you know, one, two, one for our translation, and then uh, one, four, one. I did just have to look at that instead of doing two times two. Yes. <laughs> 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 so 
So if we cut all that back, um, we get our Prelude, our app, we're adding a system, an update, and we've got this on update system that has some local state. Local state gets initialized to whatever the default value is effectively. Um, it's not quite exactly that, but it is that. So we get basically the number zero the first time this runs, and then we're just adding two and adding two and adding two and adding two. So every time this runs, and you can see here we're doing a loop, so we're just calling update, calling update, calling update, right? We're just manually iterating frames here. We're doing next frame, do the next frame, do the next frame. Um, and since we're only adding numbers, it runs really fast. Um, and we're just debugging that out. So you can see how the state increases over time because this function is running over time, but the state doesn't disappear, right? Um, and you can't access that local state from any other function. So it is local. This is the implementation of system param. Um, again, don't get too hung up on this. The, this is about the simplest implementation of system param that you're going to see. Um, query and other things are much more complicated. They don't fit on a slide. That's why we're looking at this one. <laughs> but uh, so we've got some type T. In our case, it's a U32, like we were looking at with local before, right? So we've got sync cell T uh, and local T. We initialize our state which uses from world. I want you to read from world as default um, because it will call out to the default if there's a default implementation. It's basically default with access to the world, but that's not super important. So imagine this is just the default value getting wrapped in a sync cell. We get the param, and when we get it in the uh, actual system, what we're getting is state get. So we get our U32. Query is another thing that implements system param. This is how we access all of our component data, right? So uh, in this case, we've got system query. System query <coughs> introduces another two new traits. There's a lot of traits in Bevy, like a lot of traits. Uh, <laughs> so we've got query data and query filter. Uh, you can iterate over queries, iterate over the components. And the key thing I want to drive home here is that these are basically small little databases, like ad hoc databases that you've constructed. Like, fetch me all of the items with these two components uh, that also have that thing. And then iterate over them or do whatever. Um, or more specifically, uh, these are the things that you can put in the query data slot, which is the first slot. Um, these things are implemented for a large number of tuples. You can effectively have like infinitely nested, like super complicated, um, well, not super complicated, but like the, it's just a lot like nested tuples infinitely, so you can get as much data as you ever wanted. Uh, don't nest it 16 times. I don't know. That would not be great. <laughs> but you can. Um, so we're querying here for uh, entities with a player and a score. Uh, we're getting exclusive reference to them, or at least for the score. We're getting a shared reference for player. And right at the top here, you can see that references implement query data. That is what that means. That means that you can put references there. You can put entity there. You can put option wrapping one of these there. Uh, and then we're going to skip the other three, because they're not super important. Query filter is also very interesting. Uh, so we've got query data, right, which is this data that we want to get back. And filter filters down that query. So in this case, the top query is filtering that query for transform and player ship type by only the ones that are tagged with player. This becomes more important when you start building plugins and looking at like added and changed because you can offer really ergonomic, like here's a component that you can add to your thing. And whenever that is added, right, whenever we use the added filter in our system and our plugin, we can do all of the initialization inside of our plugin, right? Take this component, put it on your entity, whatever that entity is, if you're doing, let's say, a camera, right? And you want to do a 3D pixelated view with a tune shader and a post-processor on that camera. The user only needs to slap, you know, pixelated camera component on their camera component. And then your system has added for pixelated camera component. And then you do everything you need to do hide it all away from the user, let them configure it through the component, be done with it. It's a very powerful pattern. Uh, again, queries are kind of like databases. We can iterate over a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, just checking my own time here. <laughs> uh, we can iterate, we can iterate in parallel, we can iterate in combination, we can do a bunch of different kinds of iteration. 
Uh, if there's only one of them, we can, you know, kind of do the unwrap thing or, you know, return an option or uh, actually it's a result, if I remember correctly. Um, but the most important thing on this page is get, right? Uh, when you do queries for all of these entities or all of these combinations of components, you're going to get what is effectively a key value store. If you have an entity for any other reason, if you stored an entity in a resource, like you say, this is the player's ship, whatever it is. This is the uh, you know, inventory bag, whatever it is. And you have some entity. You can do the query for all transforms and then do query.get with that entity ID and get just the transform from that database for that player. Commands, another thing that influenced system param. Uh, these are mutations, world mutations, right? Uh, one really important thing is that they're deferred. So they're not instant. Um, you're not saying commands that spawn whatever and getting the thing. You have to wait for it to be applied later. Um, this happens in another system. You can put this system anywhere in you know, the system order that you want. Uh, in this case, we're looking at spawn. So spawn spawns an entity and then associates a component with it. Uh, in the first example, we spawn an entity, associate component one with it. Uh, bundles, not really going to cover, but they're basically collections of compo components. Uh, so this is spawning an entity, associating component one, component two. Spawn an entity, associate component one, component two, then also insert strength and agility, then also insert label. So you can chain them, and then they get applied later, right? So you can't do commands.spawn and then expect to ha have the actual thing, uh, but you do get the entity ID if you want it. Events. Uh, events are actually super important, right? So we talked about a bunch of stuff. It's very easy to be like, yeah, components are important, right? Like components are everything, right? Components are all of your state. It's the health of your player. It's whatever, whatever. Um, it's easy to ignore events. But events are the way that you can decouple all of these systems. They're, they're kind of the way that you don't get these massive amounts of systems or like systems that need everything, right? In this case, we've got a system for sending events, system for receiving events. We've got dot chain here, which we haven't really talked about yet. This is forcing an order, so one has to run, then the other. By default, it's in parallel. We add the respawn event, and we do one update. So respawn event right at the bottom. We derive event on it. We've registered it. In send events, we can send as many of them as we want. Just keep respawning the player. Never let them step out of the spawn. Just keep respawning the player. Uh, and then we've got receive events. In this case, all we're doing is printing them out. So we've got the first one, the second one, the third one. Uh, the one thing I will say about events is if you want to read them in the same frame, they have to come after they're sent, right? So you have to send and then receive if you want all of that to happen in the same frame. It doesn't have to. And this is a quote uh, <laughs> that actually uh, happened half an hour ago. And I went, wow, that's such a great quote for this point in the talk. Uh, and I added this slide. Uh, so events are what let you have systems that don't grow into huge, unmaintainable monoliths. And what this means is effectively, if you have a system, right, and it's dealing with meteor collisions, what do you do after the meteor actually gets hit, right? Do you then spawn everything and despawn everything and then manage your assets and like which sprite needs to be there and like what animation is going to play? Or do you just fire an event and let some other system handle it? Um, the answer is number two, by the way. <laughs> uh, schedules. Schedules are kind of like the way that you add systems to things that will actually run in some kind of order. Um, this is a schedule that runs a system once. This is the list of actual like steps in the bevy cycle, effectively, um, or the schedule, right? I'm trying not to use the word schedule to define schedule, you know? <laughs> We've got pre-startup, startup, and post-startup. We saw a startup already. It runs once on, on startup, right? And we've got first pre-update, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, we've got update in there as well. That runs like every frame. You can write custom schedules, and people do, right? Uh, it's really powerful to be able to do this. Um, this is probably what you're going to be dealing with if you're just writing your first bevy game. You're going to do this. You're not going to write a custom schedule. You're just going to add to these schedules. 
There's a thing called schedule label that's super interesting that we don't have time to get into, uh, but I did want to point it out for the people who care. Uh, and then I cut off rendering right at the bottom on purpose. Um, rendering is a whole other app. It's a whole other sub app, which is a app, but you know, inside of the other app. I know that was very great. <laughs> Um, but basically, rendering is a whole other world. Like you can you can have app one, and then you can have like app two, and rendering is app two. Um, so we kind of like I cut that out of this presentation because it's actually uh, too long. <laughs> so plugins, then, right? And this is kind of like where the loop starts to connect. These form a critical piece of infrastructure, and they're powered by this app, right? This app is always valid. This app is this builder. This app gives us so much configuration. This app lets us add whatever we need, add all of our systems. Our systems are able to selectively query for what they actually need. We don't need to care about what people are actually doing. When they have a certain component, our system can query for that component. We can let people configure our plugins. And this is the like easy path plugin, right? Um, and the thing that I'm kind of getting across here is that Plugins are not just something that somebody else wrote that put up on crates.io and that you installed and like enabled physics for you, right? Just as, as an example of a really complicated kind of plugin. Um, plugins are a way that you can actually structure your application, right? When you're writing a bunch of files, you probably started with just a main.rs, right? It got a little bit more complicated. You decided you wanted to add some tests. Maybe you added a lib.rs, right? Maybe you started adding more modules, right? More files. Plugins are kind of like the next step after that, right? If you've got a bunch of things that have good boundaries, put them in a plugin, let them be isolated, test them in isolation, add that plugin to your app, and you don't even need to change your code, really, right? Because like when you write a plugin, you're just getting app anyway. So main.rs has an app. It's doing some configuration. It's going to add this plugin. This plugin is going to also do the exact same thing that you just did uh, and configure app. So like, there's this loop that happens, right? In that app is super important. And the way that you configure and run and access bevy apps is the same way that you do it with plugins, is the same way that you do it in all other respects. Um, this is the list of the default plugins. This is like the you know like plugin prelude. You know, uh, if you are going to start a new Bevy app, you probably want this stuff because you probably don't want to deal with picking and choosing what you want. Uh, you probably don't even know a bunch of these exist, honestly, right? Like the Winit plugin that we talked about earlier. Right now, we don't have one in our examples, so it just runs once. But you need like a window <laughs> at some point, right? So like, do you want to go to the docs and figure out that you need a window, or do you just want to add the default plugins? Um, so Bevy uses plugins to build Bevy, <laughs> which is really interesting, right? Like we talked about with the audio stuff, right? Uh, Bevy audio might not be what you need. You might want Bevy Cura audio. So you have to be able to disable that plugin entirely and insert a new one and have that work, right? Like actually work, not just be kind of hacked together, not just be like, hey, we're ignoring some stuff for no reason. Uh, plugins can use resources that are added in other places, things like that. Right. This is a clear color. Uh, what that effectively means is there's a camera in your game. When it doesn't need to render anything, what does it render? It renders this color, which is like a little bit blue. <laughs> uh, one thing that's difficult about plugin systems in other ecosystems is how do you, like, if you have this default plugin set, but you only need to change like one little thing, how do you actually do that? Right? How do you reach into everything, change that one field, and then not touch anything else? Uh, this is how you do that in Bevy. So plugin groups implement this dot set, and you can just completely replace the window plugin. And in this case, it's a game about space. So the window title should say space. Again, progressive disclosure of complexity here. Uh, build gives you the app. It can be just what you wrote in your main.rs. It doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be complicated. You don't need to have gone to have a CS degree. It can just be that kind of like spaghetti code that you were writing moved into a different location. But if you do need something better, you can opt into a bunch of these other extra functions, right? You can do async work when your plugin initializes 
and then tell Bevy when it's actually done so that you can actually move on. Um, we'll talk about a crate later that does that kind of thing. So we're going to lighten up a little bit here and talk about uh, a couple of smaller traits, deref, deref, mute. New types. Uh, I talked about earlier how Bevy only allows you to have one instance of a component per entity, right? Uh, if you insert an F32, you can't have any other F32s. <laughs> uh, hence, new types. Wrap your F32 in some struct. Um, unfortunately, what that means is that you have this little dot zero sticking around everywhere in your code base. I don't like that dot zero. <laughs> Bevy includes derives for deref, which means that this dot zero just goes away. It's really nice. <laughs> A little quality of life improvement, right? Talking about ergonomics here. Um, deref mute, also in Bevy. So the last one didn't work for mutable stuff. This one works for mutable stuff. Zero, gone. No more syntactic eyesore. Dot, dot, default, another small little quality of life improvement, right? Bevy has a lot of structs. There's a lot of things in games. There's a lot of things that have a lot of fields that are very, um, they have, like, they're just very configurable, right? Uh, so you end up typing default a lot. This is some UI code. It's got some button bundles, some image bundles. Um, if you've ever written CSS, you know how many different rules are applicable to like any random DOM element. Uh, it's the same kind of thing here, right? Like I don't want to type 50 fields, you know? I want the two or three that I care about. Uh, and then I'm going to write default for everything else. So I write default a lot. So when you import the Bevy Prelude, these two are the same, right? In regular Rust code, you can get the default trait, spread it, struct that big syntax in Bevy, you can do this. And it's really silly. <laughs> Who said generics weren't useful, huh? Um, so if T implements default, then call default. That's it. There's nothing more to say about that. You just get the thing, um, and it is the default implementation. It's actually quite nice. And there's a lot of these little things, right? Little ergonomic things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about materials. Material is actually why I wanted to write this talk in the first place. Unfortunately, there's so much to talk about in Bevy that I didn't get to go on a deep dive into rendering. Uh, I'll have to do that in another talk. But um, material here, right, it's another trait that Bevy offers. If you've ever written GPU code, if you've ever written shaders, if you've ever tried to use WGPU, um, or web GPU or any of these other you know, graphics APIs, they're extremely verbose, right? You have to write a lot of code just to get like a triangle to render on the screen. In this case, you get a bunch of these functions that you can implement. They have to return basically this string. So this is all of the code you need to initialize and use a custom shader for a material for a queue. In this case, we're defining the data that is actually going to get sent to the GPU, the data that you're going to send to the shader. It is just a struct with some derives on it. Really nice compared to you know, manually uh, setting up bind groups. The fragment shader is the only one we care about in this scenario, right? Maybe we want it to render red instead of blue or you know, whatever. Uh, so we just point to our WGSL script, and that runs our fragment shader. We get material plugin, which we're going to talk about a little bit more deeply in a second. That sort of like sets up the ability for this material to exist. And then we actually get the usage. Material mesh bundle, we're spawning a cube, we're using our material, we're setting our data. If we want to, we can update all of that data in systems. If you wanted this to be flashing rainbow, which like who wouldn't want it to be flashing rainbow, right? Um, you write a system, you get this mesh struct, and then you just change that color value. This is the material uh, plugin. 
it's got a lot more code than you actually wrote to even implement the material, honestly. Um, it initializes resources, it adds render commands, it initializes more resources, adds some more schedules. Uh, these are all things that are like generically applicable to any of your materials. Uh, and it would not be great if you had to write this instead of what we saw on the last slide, because this isn't even everything that you need to write. <laughs> And again, there's a whole sub app, right? Uh, that happened in the render app. That didn't happen in Bevy's core app. So you would have needed to know about the render app in the first place, and then also figured out how to get to it, and then also added those plugins and stuff. Um, and this kind of like, if you care, it's here and you can go do it. But if you don't care, you've got these high level APIs that like ease you into just what you need at the time that you need it which is Bevy, for me, for this talk, uh, this is what I want to get across. Bevy is the progressive disclosure of complexity. There is a bunch of high-level stuff, there's a bunch of mid-level stuff, there's a bunch of low-level stuff, and there is that for every vertical stack that you can think of, right? For UI, for rendering, for materials, for you know, dealing with components and transforms and whatnot. Bevy is extremely extensible, right? If you want to dive in, you want to implement your own system param, you don't like the way query works for some reason, you want something else to happen, you can do that. And it just works. Just implement system param. Query data query filter. You can implement your own filters, implement your own query data. Implement your own materials, we just saw this. Uh, implement your own commands, things that mutate the world. If you have a bunch of logic that you want every time you spawn a new flying saucer in your game, implement a command to deal with that. Then all you need to do is commands.add in your system instead of, you know, find the sprite, choose a location, find this other thing. Schedules, we talked about schedules. You can do custom schedules too, right? You've got, you know, update and whatever, but like maybe you're writing a physics library. Maybe you need like a custom schedule. Maybe you need it to run at specific times and you don't want the user like futzing with it, right? Make your own schedule. There's also the render graph. Um, this query data derive uh, shows off sort of like uh, abstracting queries themselves, right? So you can even go deeper, right? You can write a whole bunch of queries, you can keep everything manual, specify everything, or you can derive query data for your own struct. Everything inside of this also derives query data, so it just works, and you get everything. And now you can type my query when you query <laughs> instead of all of these other things. I want to finish off talking about a couple of crates that do these kinds of things. Um, crates that would be you know, useful to look at if you're looking at implementing any of, the, any of these APIs. Bevy Asset Loader implements its own schedule, builds on top of assets and states and schedules, things like that, um, to configure highly configurable loading of assets. And it just fits into everything else which is super nice. And now you get a loading screen that actually ends when things have loaded, right? AS Perf UI is a new one that came out, I don't know, like a week or two ago. Uh, configurable debugging implements system param to power itself. It's this thing on the right. Super configurable. There's a whole sort of level of abstraction for like sending data into this. <coughs> Bevy ECS tile map. Every entity is a tile, which is kind of like wild to think about because like that sounds like a lot, right? Um, but Bevy ECS tile map dives into that sub app that we talked about before, right? Dives into this render app and actually creates its own render pipelines to optimize all of that rendering and deal with it. And you don't have to care and you get an entity for every tile which means you can animate individual tiles, which means you can build that mining simulator where your little thing hits that brick and it you know, destructs a little bit. Uh, relationships in ECS are not built into Bevy currently, but they are built into this, which is a third-party ECS relations crate. That is very cool. Uh, builds on top of query data, query filter, world query, things like that.
Nanu, creative coding framework in Rust, used to be completely independent, is now rewriting in terms of bevy plugins. Ongoing work, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. I don't want to commit them to anything they haven't actually committed to. Um, but very interesting that this is happening, because it means that they don't have to maintain their own rendering, right? It doesn't mean they don't have to maintain their whole own ecosystem. They can build on top of Bevy. Um, so the end, Bevy is the progressive disclosure of complexity. The ergonomics of the APIs, uh, when you look at it, actually, is a bunch of stacks of different APIs at different levels, going from you know, the basics to the expert to everywhere in the middle. Um, we didn't talk a lot about actual game development today. Um, I do have a game if you all want to see it. Um, but otherwise, I think that we are good for... Okay, let me, uh, let me show you a game. Let me mirror here. Is that showing? Yeah, great, cool. Um, asteroids, <laughs> basically, anyway. This is Bevy UI. Uh, you can click stuff, spawn in some world, or spawn in some ship, right? We talked about this earlier. Lasers going forward, things different spawning, events. Um, one thing notable is that it wraps around, right? I know the game is not super interesting, but the way this is implemented is. So I've got this movement plugin. I add systems to the update method. There is linear movement, which accounts for meteors and lasers. There's spin, which is only applied to meteors. And there's wrapping movement, which is applied to anything I want to wrap around like we were seeing before, which is meteors, ship. You know, maybe you have a boss that you don't want wrapping movement on. This component is the API, right? Linear movement, where is it going? How fast should it move? And then linear movement is like a relatively simple system, right? It is a query that looks for transforms with the linear movement component and the, uh, the amount of time that has passed, right? We need to be able to figure out where we're going and how far we're going. We don't actually care what it is that's moving. Doesn't matter. Meteor, ship, laser, doesn't matter. It's moving in a line that way. So all we need is the transform. All we need is how fast it should go, which direction it should go. Same thing for the others, right? Spin is the same way. Query for the component, spin it over time. Wrapping movement, very similar. Query for anything with the wrapping movement, and when it goes outside of the screen, move it to the other side. Is this the meteor file? No, it's not the meteor file. So meteor bundle, meteor types, meteor speeds. We're spawning here. Bunch of different stuff, bunch of those components that we saw earlier. So I can add these to anything now, right? In this case, the meteor has linear movement, and it spins, and has wrapping movement. But if I didn't want it to have wrapping movement later, I just remove that component, which I can also do at runtime. Um, the other thing I want to mention here before I kind of like close this out um, is if you can't delete code, then you're stuck with it, right? Uh, and the way that these systems are set up, right, these little systems here that operate on just what they need to are really easy to delete. <laughs> like, if I want linear movement to behave a different way, I delete that and I rewrite it. I don't care. It's 20 lines of code, right? Um, and you don't want things that are 50 query systems, right? You don't want everything to come in. Um, you want things like this. You want to be able to just delete that, change it. Uh, and that's the talk. So thank you.